Please join me in welcoming John. Great. Can everyone hear me OK? All right. Over the last 12 months, there have been incredible advancements in the fields of robotics, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things. Now, this is going to create incredible challenges for communities and businesses just like ours. But for the businesses that are willing to embrace this change and embrace this disruption, the opportunities are going to be endless. So I'm going to quickly introduce myself. My name is John McElligot, again. For the last several years, I was the Senior Vice President and Chief Communications Officer of Royal Square Development and Construction in downtown York. Now, during my time with the company, we went from $100,000 to $1.5 million to most recently the $11 million revitalization of downtown Market Street. I helped grow the company from three employees to over 40, and in 18 short months, we acquired over 50 properties in downtown New York by using lean startup principles and embracing disruptive technology. Now, I left about a year ago because I saw an opportunity to bring a new technology to York, Pennsylvania. Since then, I founded York Exponential. We're a company that develops artificial intelligence, deep learning, and the Internet of Things, primarily for small to medium-sized manufacturers. In addition to that, I saw another opportunity, and I founded The Fortress, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Now, I, I like to walk a lot, so if you guys follow and you can hear me, let me know if there's a problem. Let me know as well. Um, I've had a chance to give this presentation or variations of this presentation all across the United States uh, to CEOs of companies, economic development groups, and recently, actually in December, I was invited to the White House to talk about exactly this topic, and then invited back again in January to be a part of a roundtable. See, disruption is working its way into every single industry, nonprofit, governmental agency, and education institution. It's starting to rock businesses that have been stable for 40 or 50 years to their core. Now, whenever I give this presentation, I like to start with this quote, because I think it puts everything in perspective. The world's largest taxi firm, Uber, owns no cars. The world's most popular media company, Facebook, creates no content. The world's most valuable retailer, Alibaba, carries no stock. And the world's largest accommodation provider, Airbnb, owns no property. Now let that sink in, because these businesses are not more than 10 years old, but the industries they're impacting are thousands of years old. And there isn't anyone running these companies that come from these industries. So to truly understand how fast things are going to change and, and how they're actually not going to slow down, as far as I'm concerned, it's not just the technology, because the technology is incredible. And I'm going to talk about a lot of really cool stuff today. The key to really understanding why technology has been moving so quickly and why it's not going to slow down is this. Who knows what this is? Anybody shout it out? Napster. Napster. All right. So to really understand why things are moving quickly, you have to understand the millennial mindset. So we're going to go back in time to 1999. So to just put it in its context, um, during this time period, the terrible band Smash Mouth was topping the charts. Everybody was trying to decide, do you take the red or the blue pill? And every time me and my friends did anything, we all like moved in slow motion because we'd all just seen the Matrix. And the one rule about Fight Club was you don't talk about Fight Club. So just to put it in this context, I was a sophomore in college. Now, when I was in college, I had two jobs. And one was one of the greatest jobs I'd ever have, and one was one of the worst jobs I'd ever had. And they were both in the same mall. So the first job I had was I worked at what was called the Great Steak and Potato. Does anybody know what this is? OK, so I am Irish, so I never thought I would be sick of steak and potatoes. But I'll tell you what, I was. So in the mall, literally, this, the space I would work would be about half the size of this stage. And I was the only person that worked there. I had to take the orders. I had to man the grill. I had to serve the grill. It was, it was horrible. By the end of every shift, if anyone's worked fast food before, you're all greasy and disgusting. And there's only so many times you can be chased home by dogs before you're just like, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. I'm done. But I stuck it out. And the reason I stuck it out was because at 1.30, after the lunch rush every day, I would go to what would be one of the greatest jobs I ever had. See, I worked in a record town. Now, Record Town was one of the last chains of record stores before they all began closing down. Now, it was everything you could possibly imagine when you think about working in a record store. I got to goof off with my friends all day. I got to bring my guitar to work. But one of the greatest things was I got to be the guy that would bring new music to everybody. At that time, the only real way to discover new music was radio stations, MTV, 
or the record stores. You guys remember the big towers with the headphones? And everybody would come in, and they'd cram around listening to new music. Now, one of the benefits of working at the record store, and nobody really talked about this at the time, was this. One time a month, I got to be the hero in my dorm. Because the first Tuesday of every month, we would get what were called CD samplers. So we would get new music before everybody else. And me and all the other people that worked at the record store would make copies and bring them back to our dorms. So that Tuesday, I got to be the hero of the dorm. And I remember this vividly, walking back into the dorm on a Monday after a shift, and I heard the new Third Eye Blind song blaring from my friend Fred Duff's room. So I pounded on the door and I demanded where he got this from, because I was supposed to be the guy that brings new music, and I was supposed to be bringing it on Tuesday. And after he'd calmed me down, he told me, listen, listen, I got it from Napster. And I'm like, what's a Napster? And he said, well, it's this website where you can download free music. And the more that you download it, the easier it is to share, and then more people can download it faster. And I said, so you're stealing it? And he said, no, we're sharing it. <laughs> and I thought, well, I like music, and I like sharing. I should do this. And so I did. And then me and all my friends did it more and more and more. Now, this is almost 15 years ago to today. Some of you might remember this. When the drummer from Metallica, Lars Ulrich, went on TV, and he stood before Congress, and this is what he had to say. Napster and file sharing services like Napster will be the death knell of the music industry. They take money out of hardworking artists' pockets, and they're going to destroy everything. Now, me and all my friends watched this, and in response to Lars Ulrich saying this on TV, this is what we had to say. Shut up, you rich, whiny, rock star baby. You gotta be kidding me. You're a millionaire. And we're just a bunch of struggling college kids that want to listen to music. And so we did it more and more and more. Now keep this in your head, because this is the reason that things have been changing so quickly, and they're not going to slow down. It's not the advances just in technology, because it is. Because some of the tech I'm going to talk about today is incredible, and it's happening right now. But it's this mindset. This is the key to understanding why things have been changing so quickly, and why they're never going to slow down again. So to understand, before I start talking about some of this technology, I'm going to put it in its context, because a lot of it's going to sound crazy if you don't follow it really quickly or closely, but understanding kind of how we got here without us realizing is important. This is the world of the future, according to Reader's Digest in 1966. Apparently by 1999, we were all supposed to be flying around in jetpacks and living underwater. Or the world of back to the future. So some of you might remember this from last year, it was Back to the Future Day, when we were supposed to have flying cars. Um, I really should probably update this slide, because thanks to things like the HoloLens, our holographic technology is way better than this. And we do have hoverboards. Uh, they don't really fly, they just set your pants on fire. But we've got them, <laughs> right? So I mean, kudos to technology. Um, but this is a perfect example of how fast technology can creep up on you, and it moves so quickly, but so quietly, for one reason. Technology does not grow in a linear fashion. Human beings think in a linear way, and it's actually served us really, really well for a long time. Like if a deer was in a field and it was running, and you had to take it out with a bow and arrow, you could anticipate where the deer's gonna be, release, and take it down. Now you don't expect the deer to all of a sudden speed up and fly into space, right? That doesn't happen. So for millennia, that has served human beings perfectly. Well, technology moves differently because it grows exponentially. Exponential growth is very, very different. And it's hard for us as human beings to wrap our heads around because it starts so small that it seems like it's not moving at all. So a story that I like to tell, and I kind of borrowed this from Ray Kurzweiler, who's the head of deep learning for Google. And he likes to talk about the invention of chess. So many years ago, there was an emperor. And this emperor loved to play games, but he'd mastered every game there was in the kingdom. So he sent out a decree saying, whoever can come up with a game that I can't win at right away will be granted anything that their heart desires. So people came from all over the place, and the king proceeded to beat everybody that came in with a new game, except for one man. An inventor came in, and he had fashioned a chessboard. So he sat down with the king, and he showed him how to play, and he, he continued and soundly beat the emperor over and over and over. So the emperor said, you can have whatever you want. This is incredible. This encapsulates everything that needs to be in a game. And the emperor said, I want 
or the, the inventor said, I want one simple thing. I want one grain of rice placed on the first square of the chessboard. And on the second square, I want two grains of rice. And on the third, I want four, and then 16, and so on and so forth, growing exponentially. And the emperor said, granted, this seems like a very, very humble request. But very quickly, the emperor realized that he'd been duped. Because by the time it was a quarter of the way through the board, there was more rice than in the whole kingdom. And by the time it had approached half of the board, there was more rice than in the whole world. In reality, if the emperor had stuck to his word and given the inventor what he asked for, this is how many grains of rice he would have had to give. See, that's how exponential technology grows. It starts off very, very tiny, where it doesn't seem like it's moving at all. And very, very quickly, it grows to the point that we cannot comprehend. And that's what we're at. 10 years ago, who could have imagined this? Very, very quickly, this kind of technology has caused disruption across any industry in the world. And the truth is this. We've just entered the second half of the chessboard. We're at the beginning of what experts are calling the second machine age. Now, most recently, the World Economic Forum met in January. All the leaders from around the world got together and said, we're in the fourth industrial revolution. What are we going to do? Uh, the first machine age was powered by the steam engine. Refined by James Watts in the 1700s, it catapulted our civilization into the future. We went from having to work seven days a week to five days a week. It created the middle class. Prosperity spread across the globe, and we had to rethink everything from healthcare to education. And the second machine age is very, very different, and it's here right now. Rather than being powered by the steam engine, it will be powered by robotics, artificial intelligence, and the internet of things. And we're right in it right now. Now, when I talk about robots, probably a lot of you guys think of these robots. So these are the big industrial robots. We've had these for a long time. They're dangerous. They're expensive. They're not smart. They have to be kept away from humans. But starting this year, and one of these guys is a good example, you're going to start seeing these robots work their way into different places on the factory floor. In fact, these robots are getting smarter right now, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Thanks to Industry 4.0, these robots are being connected through a network, so changes can be made on the factory floor autonomously. And starting this year, you're going to see robots working their way out of the factories and into our businesses, our educational institutions, and even our homes. I'm going to talk about that as well. Tapping into the Internet of Things. And then I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence. If you've picked up a newspaper in the last 12 months, you can't help but read artificial intelligence headlines. It seems like every day there is an incredible breakthrough. And actually, this week, something amazing happened. I'm going to talk about that, too. So I know the gentleman this morning briefly touched on the Internet of Things. Um, is everyone here familiar with the Internet of Things? OK, so a few of you. I'm going to walk you through a really quick scenario, just to understand this kind of impact. You wake up in the morning, your alarm goes off. You hit your alarm on snooze, your alarm tells your coffee maker to pour your coffee. You walk downstairs. As you walk downstairs and take your coffee out, your door knows that your dog needs to go out. So it opens up and lets your dog out. As your dog comes back in, your dog's collar lets your door know to close again. As you take your coat off the coat rack, your coat rack lets your car know that you're about ready to leave. Your car tells your garage door to open up. Your car pulls out and picks you up in the front of your house. That technology exists. Like That's not future technology. That's what's happening right now. And you can see some stats up here. By 2025, there will be $11 trillion worth in this industry. And there will be 500 billion devices within 20 years. That's incredible. Drones have also been making the headlines a lot recently. And I love talking about drones for this one specific reason. Because drones are a perfect example of how easy it is for even experts in their fields to drastically underestimate how fast exponential technology will grow. See, in 2010, the FAA said, based on the current rate of technology, by 2020, there would be 15,000 drones in the skies in the United States. We sell more than 15,000 drones a month. In fact, just this Christmas, over 11 million drones were sold. That's how fast exponential technology is growing. Now, autonomous vehicles. This week's been a big week for autonomous vehicles. I don't know if you guys know all the different things that happened. But the reason I put Tesla up there is because Elon Musk is a perfect example of a disruptor. 
See, last year in October, Elon Musk announced that the same way you would update your iPhone, they were going to update their Teslas. And so one day in November, Tesla owners woke up and their cars could drive themselves. There was no legislation. There was no passage through the government. It just happened. Now, this has created something of an arms race, and auto manufacturers are hopping on board left and right. In fact, GM just invested half a million dollars in Lyft. And you can see here, Honda said, well, you know what? For $20,000, we're going to have an autonomous vehicle on the road that regular people can get. Some of, so, some of you might not know this happened this week as well. All the leaders of Google and all the automobile industries met with the Senate to fast track laws so that we will have autonomous driving vehicles on the road faster than you can possibly imagine. The reality is this, they're already there. So right now, they're in response mode. Artificial intelligence has been making huge strides. Some of you might remember this. This is when IBM's Watson challenged and soundly beat two of the reigning champions. What you might not know is that Watson wasn't created to win game shows. Watson is actually a doctor. In fact, Watson is a network of doctors that right now are trying to cure cancer and diagnose patients around the world. Now, IBM opened this back end so that any developer can now tap in to a supercomputer. Who knows what the game Go is? OK, so there's a, a few of us here. Now, now Go is a 2,000-year-old Chinese board game that was always said that there'd be no way artificial intelligence could beat this, because it's very different than chess. It's very different than Jeopardy. Games like this can be brute forced. So if you just get a powerful enough computer, it can force its way through to beat a human being. Well, the reality is this. With a game like Go, just to put it in its context, the possible outcomes for a game of Go, if you were to take the number of every atom in the universe and add a trillion, 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 trillion to that number, that wouldn't even match the possible outcomes. So it was seen as something that artificial intelligence would never be able to do because it wasn't about just an algorithm or data. It was about intuition. And even just a month ago, the world's leading experts in artificial intelligence said that we were decades away from anything like this happening. Guess what? It happened Tuesday. Like, this is a really big deal because Google's AlphaGo was not created to win at Go. In fact, it, it wasn't programmed to do anything but learn. So it watched games online, it analyzed hundreds of thousands of games played by humans, and then it played millions of games against itself. And in a matter of months, it beat the world champion. So the importance of something like this cannot be stressed enough. Because the difference between algorithms and programs that are written for Baxters or for robotics that we have right now is they're programmed to do something. They're not programmed to learn something. And right now, Google, and you guys are welcome to follow up with me afterwards, have connected 14 robotic arms together. And they're running a program very similar to this, that they did not program the robots to do anything. They're 14 connected arms, and they are learning the same way toddlers are on how to pick up and do tasks for manufacturing. Like, that's happening right now. And each arm is teaching the other arms in real time how to get smarter, better, and faster with current hardware. So that's going to start working its way into every possible business. And pretty soon, you're going to start seeing it in these guys. So this is a Sawyer. And you can see up here, this is his big brother, Baxter. These are collaborative robots with price tags under 40000 safe to be around human beings, and easy to program. You're going to start seeing these guys a lot more. To the right is the second generation of collaborative robots. This is ABB's Yumibot. You can see here the German chancellor really doesn't know what to do about this. <laughs> but, but thanks to AlphaGo and algorithms just like AlphaGo, these robots are about to get a heck of a lot smarter, a heck of a lot faster. Now, all of this is leading to a convergent point, and we're, we're there right now. Who here has a smartphone? OK. I'm going to ask everybody to do me a favor, a little bit of audience participation. This is what I want you to do. I want you to take your smartphone, and I want you to hold it up. All right. And I, and I want you to think in your head, right? In fact, you know what? Say it out loud. This phone is not a phone. 
great. I want you to turn it on its side. This phone is a platform. Say it with me. This phone is a platform. There was no possible way that the taxi driver, 10 years ago, could have thought for one minute the device up to his ear would put him out of work. There was no possible way to make that connection. But the businesses that grew the fastest and the businesses that have been the most disruptive understood that this is not a phone. This is a platform. All of the stuff that I've talked about today, don't think robot. Put yourself in the shoes of that taxi driver with the phone up to their ear and think platform. Because that's all this new technology is. And that is why it's going to grow faster than we can possibly imagine. Now we're going to watch a quick video. This is Jibo. Now Jibo is going to be one of the world's first social robots. So these are the robots you're going to start seeing this year in our schools, our businesses, and our homes. So we're going to watch this video, but in your head, think platform, platform. This is not a robot. This is a platform. And think of every possible industry this technology can impact. And then we're going to come back and talk a little more. This is your house. This is your car. This is your toothbrush. These are your things. But these are the things that matter. And somewhere in between is this guy. Introducing Jibo, the world's first family robot. Say hi, Jibo. Hi, Jibo. <laughs> Jibo helps everyone out throughout their day. He's the world's best cameraman. By intelligently tracking the action around him, he can independently take video and photos so that you can put down your camera and be a part of the scene. Jibo, take the picture. He's a hands-free helper. You can talk to him, and he'll talk to you back so you don't have to skip a beat. Excuse me, Anne? Yes, Jibo. Melissa, just sent a reminder that she's picking you up in half an hour to go grocery shopping. Thanks, Jibo. He's an entertainer and educator. Through interactive applications, Jibo can teach. Let me in or else I'll... Ha! And I'll... Ha! And I'll blow your house in. <laughs> hey, where'd you go? There you are. <laughs> He's the closest thing to a real-life teleportation device. He can turn and look at whoever you want with a simple tap of your finger. Check out my turkey dinner, Mom. I wish you wouldn't eat that. Hey, one. they make turkey pizza? I want turkey pizza. <laughs> and he's a platform, so his skills keep expanding. He'll be able to connect to your home. Welcome home, Eric. Hey, buddy. Can you order some takeout for me? Sure thing. Chinese, as usual? You know me so well. And even be a great wingman. You have a voice message from Ashley. Want to hear it? Absolutely. Hey, call me when you're home. Better make that takeoff for two, Jibo. We've dreamt of it for years, and now he's finally here. And he's not just an aluminum shell, nor is he just a three-axis motor system. He's not even just a connected device. He's one of the family. Jibo, this little bot of mine. Now this is the first generation of this stuff. And this is here right now and will be the price of an iPad. Now, whenever I show this video, people either, either think it's really, really awesome or really, really creepy, right? Those are the two, right? But take that out of your head because whether you think it's really, really awesome or really, really creepy, it's really, really happening. Like, this is happening right now. This is not future stuff. This is not far off stuff. This is going to be in our homes in a matter of months. Now, I get really excited because every single day something new comes out that just blows my mind. I mean, just yesterday, scientists hacked the brain of a paraplegic so he could move his arm again. Incredible stuff. Like, this is amazing. Just a couple days ago, the leaders of some of the largest technology companies and automakers stood before the Senate about robot cars. This is real life stuff that's happening. And I do, I get really, really, really excited. But the truth of the matter is this. Last year, Gartner released a report that said within 10 years, so just a decade, 
one third of our population may be unemployable. Not unemployed, unemployable. The advancements in artificial intelligence, robotics, and the Internet of Things are happening so fast that our communities, our businesses, and our educational institutions cannot keep up. Now at this point, I, I normally get some kind of kickback, right, because we've, we've been here before. Back in the 80s, it was supposed to be the robot revolution. Things were supposed to change. The Internet came out, oh, it's supposed to change everything, and it did. But the truth of the matter is this. While technology is advancing at an exponential rate, the key to understanding why it's never going to slow down is this. Remember when I said that Lars Ulrich went on TV and he said Napster and file sharing services like that would be the death knell of the music industry? He was right, but he was kind of wrong. See, when me and my friends basically responded with, shut up, we're going to do it anyways, he was wrong about Napster being the death knell, but he was right about be it being the end. Because the truth of the matter is this. We destroyed the music industry. But none of us wanted to. We just wanted to listen to music. Now, I give this presentation a lot to CEOs in economic development groups that are, how do we attract millennials to move downtown? How do we get millennials to, to want to come and work for our companies? What's it like being a millennial? Now, I, and I get to say this because I was there like at the very, very beginning. Being a millennial is like this. It's like being given the keys to a nuclear reactor, but with no instruction manual, and we're just pressing buttons. We've been given too much technology too fast, and we don't make the connection from our actions to our consequences. We're the same generation that wants organic, and we want farm to table, and we don't want people to be working in sweatshops, and we want people to have a living wage. We're also the same generation that will download an app on our iPhone that might put a million people out of work. But we don't think about it. And that is why technology has been moving so quickly and will never slow down because we are the first generation of mass early adopters. Now at this point, sometimes I still get kicked back. Who here has been following what's been going on with artificial intelligence? Okay. Anybody seen the Jibo video before? D did anyone know about AlphaGo and that just happened? Okay, cool. Who's seen this? Hands up, anyone that's seen this? Because if you think millennials move quickly, and you think engaging the millennial workforce or attracting millennials to your businesses or your homes, wait till you see our kids. Because they're here right now. And if you want to have a business five years from now, you need to start thinking how to engage these guys. Stop worrying about just engaging the millennials. Because we're at what's called peak millennial. It means there will never be more millennials than there are right now. We have hit a tipping point where we're going to start settling down, growing families, and thinking about the next generation. So this is who you're going to be dealing with very, very quickly. And they're not early adopters, they just are. So I'm really excited. I know I probably said a bunch of crazy stuff and everybody's like, run them out of here. But the reality is this, we really do have an incredible opportunity. And not just an incredible opportunity in general, I think this region has an amazing opportunity. The last time the world changed this much and this fast, it was our region that saved the world. So I'm going to take you back in that time machine, and we're going to go even further back to the spring of 1940. And I get to talk about York a little bit. So at this time, the United States was not involved in World War II. Germany was on the move, and many communities here were thinking about it, but we, aren't, we weren't all actively engaged. Now, a lot of communities were saying, it's not our problem. It's happening over in Europe. We've had enough from World War I. We don't want to be involved. But the leaders in York knew that this was going to be a big deal. And just because it wasn't here yet and the Nazis weren't on our doorstep didn't mean the world was not going to change. So the Manufacturers Association of York nominated four leaders. They were given six months to come up with a plan to prepare our community for the coming change. And along with these six months, they were given three guiding principles. And when I go over them, you're going to think it was crazy that they were able to do it back then, because it's just as crazy if we could do it right now. The first, that we should enter our duties with a firm conviction of necessity for this national defense program. So everybody was on the same page. Like, everybody knew this was happening. It didn't matter what other people said. Everyone in that community said, you know what? This is going to happen. We need to be ready for it. And everything needs to be about facing this challenge. The next, that we should be wholeheartedly and without any reservation back the president 
and his endeavor to prepare America and forgetting for the time being all political affiliations. Now, for me, this isn't a political statement. At the time, they were very divided. And you can see, based on what's happening now with our election cycle, that the nation is still very divided. But the truth of the matter is this. It wasn't that their differences weren't important, because they were. It was they weren't as important as what they were facing right now and can be put aside for another day. And this one is just as radical. That we would, with grace, seek and consider suggestions and ideas from all branches of our people and from every source, and that we would interest ourselves in everything that pertained to defense or that seemingly barred progress. See, they knew a plan that didn't include everyone was an incomplete plan. It needed to have business owners, nonprofits, everybody, regardless of socioeconomic background or education, needed to come together to be a part of this plan. And not only that, everything needed to be focused. Because if it wasn't a part of the plan, it was put aside. Because everybody needed to be moving in exactly the same direction. And so after six months in using these guiding principles, they came out with the York Plan. And this is actually in the Yorktown Hotel where they announced this. And if you look at it, it's a 15-point plan, and it's everything the technology world has been doing for the last 15 years. Crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, open sourcing of technology, accelerated education. Companies that were competitors began working together. One company would use their equipment from 8 to 11 at night. They'd let a competitor use it from 11 to 8 in the morning. Thanks to this plan, and it was almost immediately adopted by the whole of Pennsylvania, one-third of all the revenue and one-third of everything created in World War II came out of Pennsylvania. One-third of everything created during that time. Now, the White House saw this and was so impressed and hired people from York to travel to Rotary Clubs to go all over the nation recruiting communities to the plan under the slogan, do what you can with what you have, and it became a national model. In fact, it was so critical that the Japanese Air Force made York number three target after the White House and the Pentagon, because they knew if they could take out the York plan, they could win the war. That's incredible, and we never talk about this. So that's why I'm excited to be here right now, in this point in history, talking to this group, because the last time the world did change this much, it was the manufacturers that led the way, the manufacturers that provided the jobs, the manufacturers that made the technology that saved the world. That's our heritage. So what now? Because I know I threw a lot of stuff very, very quickly. And we're not going to cover everything, but I do want to leave time for question and answer if we do have some. So I like to pull from the York plan, because I think that plan actually, as I said, it was just as radical back then as it would be right now. So the first one is this. And this is imperative, because it comes up all the time, except this is happening. Just this week, I had a conversation with two different individuals. One. If I had told you the manufacturing company and who he was, you'd know, because it was a, it's a large manufacturer in this area. And the other one was a board member of an economic development group. And they both told me the same thing that I've heard from lots and lots of people. You know, get your passion, get how excited you are, but the truth of the matter is this, man, you're too far off into the future. Right, we're dealing with this stuff now, you're too far in the future. I cannot reiterate this enough. 99% of this presentation has happened. This is not the future, this is the past. But thanks to Hollywood, we've been conditioned to, to say it didn't happen, so any of this kind of talk goes in my future box. Right? We're not going to be prepared for this if we do not realize that this is the past. This is not the future. This week, the Senate met to talk about robot cars. This is happening right now. This is not happening in some far off, distant future that will not affect us. Next is we need to do exactly what they did during the York Plan. Just because the Nazis weren't at their door, they made the decision we were going to be proactive instead of reactive. Did they have all the answers? No. Did they know the world was going to change? Yes. And so they did what they could with what they had and brought a community together. Next, the three main points of the York Plan were these. Communication. Everyone understood what the message was. Everybody knew where the message had to go. In fact, I gave a presentation in Chambersburg, and after I got off stage, there were tears in the eyes of one of the gentlemen that I was sitting there, and I asked him, you know, is everything okay? And apparently his grandfather had run York Safe and Lock, which was one of the companies that stepped up during the York Plan. And he said, I remember the York Plan because we'd wake up and it was the York Plan. We'd go to school and it was the York Plan. We'd eat lunch and it was the York Plan. We would come home and it was the York Plan. Everybody knew the message. 
everyone knew it was happening and everybody was behind it. The next was collaboration. The manufacturers recruited organizations from all over the place to be a part of this because they knew that everyone had to be a part. So different industries working together to solve these problems as a collective was the key. And they also realized very quickly it couldn't just be York. And the president realized it couldn't just be York. It needed to be a coalition. This needed to be happening all across Pennsylvania and all across the nation. It just so happens Pennsylvania got it before everyone else, which is why one third of everything was created happened in PA. That's the opportunity we have. I've spoken to economic development groups all across the United States. I've been at the White House multiple times. No one has the answer, but they know it's happening. The same way Pennsylvania stepped up when no one else had a plan, we're in that position once again. The next is this, embrace disruptors. I also hear this a lot from economic development groups, is we need more young people. We need more young people. The reality is you don't. And, and I'm gonna put this in context, right? There's a difference between being young and being disruptive. There was a recent study done by Pew Research that surveyed, I believe it was 2,000 Americans, all different backgrounds, and they said, do you think in the future most jobs will be done by robots? Two-thirds of the group said, probably to definitely. When they were also surveyed, how many people think it'll be your job they take? 80% said no chance. So 60% of them, over 60% said yes, it's probably likely that robots will take all the jobs, but 80% said no way mine. This is what's called, I guess it's a psychological break that's called optimism bias, where you think it can't happen to you. One of the interesting things is, from the study though, millennials were the ones that thought there was no chance. It wasn't the older generation. The older generation saw how fast things changed. The millennials grew up with it. So there was no way they could possibly fathom it. And this is a key one. Embrace new technology now. There are new things coming out on a daily basis that are going to impact and affect your businesses. From having multiple discussions with Mantech and other manufacturers, I started to learn a lot about the manufacturing world, and I know that not a very big portion of your budget typically goes to technology. Because everything is so granular, right? Like you're so focused on getting things out the door. Like you've gotta keep things running almost down to the millisecond. The truth is this, those milliseconds in exponential terms are going to be years. So now is the time to begin embracing new technology. Understanding that moving forward, there will be no manufacturing companies. There will be no hospitals. There will be no schools. Everything will be a technology company. Everything. The same way in World War II, everybody was a defense company. Now they did different things, but they all had that similar goal and understanding. Moving forward, technology will have to be a critical piece to building and growing your businesses. This, is, this next one, before I go to the slide, has been a little bit of a struggle for us and having discussions with other training institutions and things, this has been a big one. Train for jobs that are not here yet. Any kind of training facility, and I saw, I just recently saw it, it was on the cover of uh, the Central Penn Business Journal, talking about employers say and then other things, right? Training, up until this point, has been in response to what all of you say you want. So when you say you want X skill, Training groups look locally and say, what do you need? They're not looking at what the White House is saying, and they're not looking at what's happening with the World Economic Forum. They're stopping with you. So if you were to say, we need more horse and buggy drivers, they would start pumping out horse and buggy drivers faster than you can possibly imagine. The time to hire for jobs like this is not when you need people to do jobs like this. Like, um, I don't know if Scott's still in here, but we've had multiple discussions about cybersecurity and the importance of cybersecurity. I know for him, this has been a big passion in preparing manufacturers. And he's had a chance to talk to a lot of you, and I asked, I said, okay, so is cybersecurity gonna be a big deal? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, well, how many manufacturers are saying they want people who know that cybersecurity? He's like, zero. None. Everyone in this room will be the ones that dictate what this workforce looks like and how fast we get them. So we need to start training for these jobs now because when we need people to do them, it'll be too late to hire people to do them. The next, and this is a, another big one, and I've kind of learned being in York. I've, I've been here for over a decade. And as I started to get more involved in economic development and business, I started to realize this was a thing. People started to make certain things their passion. And they raised money and they built maybe large facilities or they came up with slogans and different campaigns that were gonna move the needle. 
And so everyone became emotionally attached to a lot of things. So as years would go on, there would be some new initiative, and maybe it wouldn't pick up steam. And then something else would happen, and people would go, oh, it's like this thing we talked about years ago. And so they would take it, and they would try to put it in that box again. So all of a sudden, everybody became really invested in projects that would go on forever and ever and ever. The truth of the matter is this. A lot of the arguments maybe we'd had before are about to be obsolete. Like, they're not going to matter anymore. Now, I'm gonna use an example that this is not a political statement, so do not take this as a political statement one way or the other. So last year, I'm sure everybody remembers when there was the school shootings. There's been a rise in violence, school shootings, ISIS, terrorist attacks, all around people shooting up public spaces or schools. Now, in response to this, President Obama said, we're gonna close the gun show loophole. Do you guys remember this? Now, the Democrats on one side, and again, this is not a political statement, saw this as an opportunity to say, listen, this is something we've believed for a very long time, that it should be harder for people to just, anyone to go in and buy a gun, and we wanna stop crazies from getting guns. So we're gonna focus on stopping people from being able to buy guns. And on the, the other side, the Republicans said, listen, guns are a fundamental right, like it's the bad guys that are the ones causing this problem. The only thing that's gonna stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. You guys have probably heard this before. So President Obama made this big statement that this was gonna happen, right? So everybody's arguing about how do we stop people from getting guns. The truth of the matter is this. I can show you right now hundreds of videos on YouTube on how to 3D print a gun. I can also show you thousands of videos on how to 3D print a drone. This argument is from the past. Now people are emotionally attached to it, but the reality is this. You could, if you wanted to, launch a school shooting from the beach in the Bahamas from your iPhone. That's the world we live in now. Don't believe me? Just this week, there was a student from Connecticut University that is suing the school because they were expelled for producing this. This is a drone made up of off-the-shelf parts and 3D printed pieces with a handgun attached to the front of it. This isn't happening, this has happened. The world has fundamentally changed and it's up to us to get ahead of it. See, disruption's been building and not only is it coming, but it's here. The world is changing. Things are not gonna slow down, they're only gonna speed up. Now at this point, I've thrown a ton of stuff, and I know if you really haven't thought about a lot of this stuff, it's probably a ton to process very, very quickly. And most of you are probably finding yourself in the innovator's dilemma. Like if you don't wanna kill me, you're probably in this position. Now the innovator's dilemma is this. So you've been running successful companies. Maybe you've been growing, you've been seeing amazing things happen, and all of a sudden a bunch of new information comes in. And you try and figure out, okay, so what do I do with this? When do I act on it? Do I, do I take it and try and fit it in an old model? Do I trash my model? Do I ignore it and think it'll never happen? That is the innovator's dilemma. But what ends up happening is, while we're stuck in this cycle, very quickly the world moves on by the time we've made the decision. And that's where we are right now. Because the time to act is yesterday. So in response to this, my group, and actually with support from Mantech and a partnership with the YMCA, Last Tuesday acquired the Western National Bank in downtown York, Pennsylvania, that we are turning into the fortress. It will be the region's first exponential technology focused robotics, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things training and community center. See, we're making that first step to begin preparing our communities for this. And our big focus is on manufacturing. Because the West Coast can have Angry Birds. The West Coast can have social networks. The West Coast can have iPhone apps. Do you know what Pennsylvania does? We make machines. And all of the coolest and all of the bleeding edge technology is coming to manufacturing first. Google just patented Google Glass 2. Guess what industry it's for? Small to medium sized manufacturing. All of the most amazing technology is hitting manufacturing first. Some of you might not know this. Through a ton of our third tier cities, from New York down to Asheville, Virginia, is a dark fiber data pipe being run through the center of our cities by the end of 2016. 
giving access to cloud robotics, cloud computing, and the Internet of Things. This is a game changer for our region. But again, our technology will not be built on West Coast technology. It will be built on what we need here and what we do here, and that's manufacturing. So we have a choice, because this is the only mention of the York plan in York, Pennsylvania. It's in the parking lot of a McDonald's. We never talk about it. We never talk about the time Pennsylvania saved the world. So the choice is clear, but it's, it's up for everyone here to make. Are we going to look at this and say this is our history, and this is something we've done? Or are we going to look at this and say this is our legacy? Embracing disruption, being the leader, embracing the change, and showing the world the direction. Because the difference between history and legacy is this. History is something you look back upon. The legacy is something you live up to. And in World War II and the first York plan, it was the manufacturers that led the way. But the choice is yours. Thank you. Thank you for watching this presentation of Embracing Disruption. I'm John McElligot, CEO of York Exponential, and President of the Fortress Initiative. Over the next several months, we're going to need your help turning the Western National Bank into the Fortress of York. Technology is growing at an exponential rate. It's not slowing down. It's going to create incredible challenges for communities just like ours. But for those willing to face the change and embrace the disruption, the opportunities are endless. So again, visit thefortressinitiative.org to find out how you can help by signing up today.